Hello there, a very good evening and welcome to another edition of Primetime News on TV1. I'm Charlotte Benedict for the News First Team. I'm Shelter Mordera and these are your headlines for tonight. Minister Vijay Dasa Rajapaksa are also invited to the presidential race. Sri Lanka and the Haspaxi Matimakarka Saba and Yojanekaran, Ati Bahutarak Dina, Lima Kerlatino. No such invitation and decision yet to be reached on the candidate. SLFP responds. UNP extends invitation to four SJB members. Single Hindu Alutaru de Mangobatekino, Honda Prathana Ekala. No one will join the UNP. Chandima responds. President walks along the Pico Trail. Explore opportunities for the revival of the tourism industry. Israel and Iran issue warnings against each other. Now on your top story tonight, Dr. A.T. Aryaratna, the founder of the humanitarian organization Sarvodaya, is a person whose name is world-renowned. It is with deep sorrow that we bring to you the news of the passing of Dr. A.T. Aryaratna. Dr. Aryaratna passed away this afternoon at the age of 92 while receiving treatment at a hospital in Colombo. Born in Nunavatuna Gaul on the 5th of November 1931, Dr. A.T. Aryaratna began his education at the Mahinda Vidyalaya in Gaul. He is also a past pupil of Vidyodaya Pirivena. He laid a strong foundation and built the Sarvodaya Foundation in the year 1958 that has today transformed into Sri Lanka's most broadly embedded community-based development organization. The Yeoman service performed by Dr. A.T. Aryaratna for the welfare of the general public has been recognized both here in Sri Lanka and across the world. Dr. A.T. Aryaratna was awarded the Ramon Magsese Award for Community Leadership Philippines 1969, King Baudouin Award for International Development, Belgium 1982, Alan Sean Feinstein World Hunger Award, Brown University USA 1986, August Farrell Award Good Templar Movement for Promoting Temperance, Denmark 1990, Jamnalal Bajaj Award for Propagating Gandhian Values Outside India 1990, Niwano Peace Prize Japan 1992, ILGA Memorial Award for Public Service, Korea, 1995, Hubert H. Humphrey Award, USA, 1996, Mahatma Gandhi Peace Prize, India, 1996. <laughs> In 2007, Dr. Ari Ratna was conferred with the title Sri Lanka Bimanya, the highest national honor in Sri Lanka. Prime Minister Dinesh Kunavardhana informed the Secretary to the Ministry of Public Administration, Home Affairs, Provincial Councils and Local Government that measures will be taken to provide a state funeral for the late Dr. A.T. Ari Ratna. In more tragic news this evening, former State Minister Palita Thivara Piruma has passed away. According to the police report, he was electrocuted on his property in Matugama and succumbed to his injuries at the Kalutara Hospital. Born on the 3rd of May 1960, Palita Thivara Piruma represented Parliament from the United National Party between 2010 and 2020. He held the posts of Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs, Wyoming Development and Cultural Affairs and as State Minister of Wildlife. He entered politics from the Matuguma Pradeshiya Sabha and also served as a member of the Western Provincial Council. 
Sri Lankan President Ranil Vikramasinghe visited the Court Lodge estate owned by the Udupusellava Plantation Company in Norelia to explore opportunities for the revival of the tourism industry around the picturesque hills of Norelia. The President embarked on this journey by traversing the Pico Trail. During his walk along the Pico Trail covering a distance of 3.2 kilometers, the President engaged in friendly conversation with the workers employed at the Court Lodge estate. The Pico Trail spans 300 plus kilometers through the central highlands of Sri Lanka, regarded as one of Asia's best kept secret routes. Originating from the renowned city of Kandy, it extends south towards Hatton and Horton Plains National Park, then east through Hapatale and Alla, before meandering around the charming town of Norelia, originally constructed during the British colonial period to transport tea from vast plantations to factories, the trail holds historical significance. During his visit, President Ranil Vikramasinghe personally inspected the fundamental requirements of the plantation workers, addressing issues related to education, health care and housing. The factory at Court Lodge, known for producing light bright tea, was also inspected by the President. <laughs> When's the election? Shifting your attention to more political news here in Sri Lanka, Minister of Justice, Prison Affairs and Constitutional Reforms, Dr. Vijay Das Rajapaksa said that many, including a majority of Sri Lanka Freedom Party's Central Committee, has requested him to contest the upcoming presidential election. Minister of Justice, Prison Affairs and Constitutional Reforms, Dr. Vijay Das Rajapaksha called on Atamastan Adipati Venerable Palneka Mahemaratana Thero last night. Thereafter, he spoke to the media. <laughs> Many have made that request, especially majority of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party Central Committee. The Mahasangha and other religious leaders have also made similar requests. I am still considering these requests and I will announce my decision in the coming weeks. People don't have faith in any political party in our country currently. Therefore, the next election will be very different. Voters who traditionally vote along party lines are not facing a clear-cut choice. That is why voters are increasingly considering voting based on the candidate who is presented. If I am supporting someone else, I will have to carefully make such a decision. Since no one else stepped forward to lead our country, we joined forces with him and made a tremendous effort. In less than two years, we achieved what no one in this country or the world expected, reviving normals in the country. This leadership deserves everyone's respect. As members of that cabinet, we continue the work tirelessly. The groundwork for the change the people desired has been laid. Now, through implementation, we will realize that change. <laughs> yes, they worked very hard to bring Ranil Vikramasinghe into power. That was the best decision we could have taken to provide relief to the people of this country, given the situation in the country at that time. The people 
people who are ready to accept a certain candidate at the time will not do so today. In fact, we are seeing a situation where the SLPP is weak to a point where it is unable to nominate a candidate for the election. That is the reality of this country. Wins the election. Did the Sri Lanka Freedom Party request Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksha to contest the upcoming presidential election? General Secretary of the United People's Freedom Alliance, Tilanga Sumati Pala, had this to say. No, there's no such plan and we haven't discussed it. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksha is also from the government. We don't have double standards. We have no plans to discuss it. A presidential election has not been announced yet. Today, a group including Tilanga Sumati Pala visited the United People's Freedom Alliance headquarters, located in the building adjacent to the Sri Lanka Freedom Party headquarters today. We regret that a few people who are in power with the support of the government are under the impression that they can prevent prevent the future activities of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. We will not allow that to happen. It will not happen. Those with such intentions may think the party should be taken to that point. However, the SLFP supporters are not of the same stance. There is strong objection. We won't allow it. <laughs> Will the government that is afraid to hold the local government elections hold a presidential election? Ranil Vikramasinghe is a leader who always shied away from elections. He is trying to do the same now. We request the government to step away from its efforts to divide this party and to stop trying to suppress the opposition. We have a mechanism to engage in politics. That is our party, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. In a shameful move to prevent us from engaging in politics through our party, a prohibition order was obtained against the chairman of our party. But the Sri Lanka Freedom Party will not stop their political journey. We have opened our doors as an alliance. Come here and join hands with us. We will take forward the journey to destroy this government. <laughs> Wins the election. General Secretary of the United National Party, Palita Range Bandara, extended an invitation to the Samagi Janabala Vega MPs during a media briefing today. We are aware of what is happening to those with knowledge on the economy who are currently working with the SJB, like Dr. Harsha De Silva and Iran Vikramaratna. We know what's happening to Talatha to Korala. We are aware of what's going on with Kabir Hashim from Marvanala, who is looking into economic affairs. Today, that party is controlled by a part of the Pohut tour. Is Sajid Premadasa underestimating people like Harsha, Iran, Kabir and Talatha? If that's the case, why are you continuing to stay in a place that doesn't appreciate you? As we celebrate the dawn of a new year, I would like to invite you to join hands with Vikrama Singh to rebuild our country. <laughs> We started work on this on the 29th of January 2021. How many people have come since then? I wonder how many of them find it most enlightening or healing to come to their usual space and work with the older brothers and sisters. Wins the election. Will a group of the Samagi Jana Balavege join hands with President Ranil Vikramasinghe? MP Chandimavira Kodi responded to this question. Everyone will gather around the Samagi Jana Balavege and SJB led government will be established if a parliamentary election is held. If a presidential election is held, Sajid Prima Das will definitely be elected president. No matter how much we see them crossing over, that will be the final outcome. Claims were made saying 24 to 45 people will join them. Later, a meeting was held in Kulia Pityan and claims were made saying they will join. However, no one attended and no one will join in future either. Wins the election. 
Opposition combat. leader Sajid Premadasa said that the citizens of the country must decide on the kind of leadership the country needs. The bankrupt country now needs leadership to rebuild it. The leadership must have a vision to bring the country back on its feet. There must be a program in place. The existing program must be implemented and effectively communicated to the people of the country. All those so-called leaders need to prove to the 22 million people of this bankrupt country that their words translate into concrete actions that truly support the nation. The Bandaranaikas were here for some time. Then we had the leader who went on tours. The country was given to a certain group and they destroyed the country. Then came the leader who goes on tours across the world and he didn't bring a single cent back to the country. Then there are leaders who spend all their money on bringing large crowds of people and holding rallies and boasting a lot. The people must decide what kind of leadership the country needs. Leaders with a vision to rebuild or those who can demonstrably get things done without holding power. Ultimately, the decision rests with the people of the country. Inspector General of Police Deshabandhu Tennakon said a group of spe police special task force personnel are undergoing a special training to combat underworld activities. The IGP expressed these views at an event held in Alpitya today. 100 STF personnel are currently being trained at the Katukurunde STF training camp, especially to chase underworld gang members in motorcycles if they attempt to open fire and flee. They are being trained to take aim at while riding a motorcycle. They will complete the training soon and be deployed. Another 100 officers have been deployed on bicycles in Colombo and surrounding areas. We will also increase the number of teams deployed to combat underworld gangs from 20 to 30. 10 additional teams will be deployed. We believe this is sufficient to end it. If the need arises, we will increase the number to 50, 60 or 100. The Inspector General of Police also visited the police STF personnel deployed at camps established in the Alpitya Police Division for Operation Yukthia. A single and Tamil New Year celebration was also held at the police headquarters this morning, chaired by the IGP. The police sergeant and constable who were arrested for allegedly assaulting a youth in Madhavalachya, Anuradhapura, were remanded until the 24th of April after they were produced before the Madhavachya Magistrates Court today. Magistrate Imesha Dharmadasa today ordered the investigations related to the alleged assault to be directed to the Criminal Investigation Department. It was alleged that the assault took place on the 7th of April when a lorry that did not heed police orders was chased and stopped by police officers in Tulaveli and two people were arrested. One of the youth was taken to hospital due to pain in his testicles while being detained at the police station after the alleged assault at the time of arrest. The youth was transferred to the Anuradhapura Teaching Hospital from the Madhavachya Hospital where doctors had performed an operation to remove one of his testicles. The magistrate today also ordered the Senior Deputy Inspector General of the North Central Province to submit a comprehensive report to court regarding the actions of the officer in charge of the Madhavachya Police Station regarding the incident. When the case was called today, President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka appearing before court as an observer said the BASL will intervene in the case as the association has the authority to intervene to ensure justice is served and the rule of law is upheld. Up next is Crime Watch. One person was injured in an attack with a sharp weapon in Modaravidya. Police said the attack was carried out by two people who arrived in a three-wheeler while the victim was at a garage repairing his motorcycle.
The 26-year-old who was injured has been admitted to the accident ward of the Colombo National Hospital. Meanwhile, a 52-year-old man was stabbed to death in Borupana Rahmalana. Police said two unidentified people carried out the murder while the victim was asleep at his residence. Iran has warned the United States that any fresh Israeli military act will face decisive and quick response. Israel is awaited word on how Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu would respond to Iran's first ever direct attack as international pressure for restraint grew amid fears of an escalation of the conflict in the Middle East. Netanyahu summoned his war cabinet for the second time in less than 24 hours to weigh a response to Iran's weekend missile and drone attack. Military Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi said Israel would respond. He provided no details. The IDF remains ready to counter any threat from Iran and its terror proxies. International Atomic Energy Agency Chief Rafael Grossi says UN inspectors monitoring Iranian nuclear sites have been ordered out because of the threat of Israeli attacks on Tehran's atomic facilities. I decided to let the inspectors not return until we see that the situation is completely calm. Israel has carried out operations against nuclear sites in the region before. In 1981, it bombed the Osirak nuclear reactor in Saddam Hussein's Iraq despite opposition from the U.S. And in 2018, it admitted to having launched a top-secret air raid against a reactor in Syria 11 years prior. Three Palestinian armed groups conducted attacks on Israeli forces east of Jabalia in the north of the Gaza Strip, where Israel is attempting to create a buffer zone along the Israel-Gaza separation fence. According to a joint report from the Institute for the Study of War and the Critical Threats Project, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs, Brigades, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Palestinian Muhajideen group reported that their fighters had launched mortars and fired heavy machine guns at Israeli troops and armor operating in the area. Speaking by phone to Qatar's Emir, Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi has declared Iran's aerial attack against Israel to be a success and said Iran would deliver an even more painful blow if there are future threats to its interests. The Iranian Foreign Minister says Tehran has sent a clear warning to the White House emphasizing its readiness to swiftly and decisively respond to any fresh military adventures by Israel that threaten Iran's interests and security. During a phone conversation with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi late on Monday, Hussein Amir Abdullahian stated they have clearly warned the White House that in the event of the Israeli regime's adventurism in repeating terrorist attacks against Iran's interests and security, Tehran's next response and action will be decisive, immediate and extensive. On the 13th of April, Tehran carried out an operation against Israel which involved dozens of drones and missiles. Iran's military officials announced that certain Israeli military bases from the occupied Golan Heights to the Negev Desert had been targeted and destroyed. The military operation was in response to Israel's deadly air raid on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria on the 1st of April, in which seven Iranian military commanders were assassinated. Yesterday, it came to light that Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi is gearing up for a visit to Sri Lanka amidst escalating tensions in the Middle East, particularly in stemming from the Iran-Israel crisis. President Raisi has been extended an invitation to inaugurate the Umar Oya Multipurpose Development Project. This confirmation was echoed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The inauguration of the Umar Oya Multipurpose Development Project is slated for the 24th. Nonetheless, the Minister of Foreign Affairs clarified that Iran's response to the invitation is still pending. In Washington, D.C., the Sri Lankan delegation engaged in pivotal discussions during the IMF and World Bank Spring meetings, underscoring commitment to economic reform and sustainable development. The News First Finance Report Sri Lanka praised by IMF for economic reforms. The Sri Lankan delegation in Washington, D.C. for the IMF and World Bank spring meetings held bilateral discussions with Kenji Okamura, 
Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. State Minister Shahan Semasingh has said that Kenji Okamura commended the Sri Lankan authorities on strong program implementation and excellent reform progress. He had emphasized the need to preserve the hard-earned gains Sri Lanka has experienced since the beginning of the IMF program and continue strong ownership. State Minister Shahan Semasingh, along with Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and Secretary to the Treasury, explained to Kenji Okamura the recent socio-economic developments and the authorities' commitment to ensuring continuity and consistency of macroeconomic policies and reforms undertaken under the program. Sri Lanka and BCIU discuss investment and reforms for economic growth. The Sri Lankan delegation also had an insightful discussion during the meeting in Washington, D.C. with the Business Council for International Understanding on the development of the Sri Lankan economy and its investment prospects. The discussion centered on the potential that Sri Lanka offers for international investors and explored various sectors including education, tourism, renewable energy, agriculture and technology, where strategic investments can drive sustainable economic growth and development. Both sides reviewed the current macroeconomic landscape of Sri Lanka, including recent reforms that have transformed to results. Sri Lanka discusses debt restructuring with IMF Executive Director. The Sri Lankan delegation also met with Dr. Krishnamurthy Subramaniam, IMF Executive Director for India and Sri Lanka, on the sidelines of spring meetings. They discussed the progress of debt restructuring as well as next steps towards the finalization of the second review of the IMF program following the staff level agreement that was reached in March 2024. Sri Lanka and World Bank discussed reforms and continued support. Furthermore, the delegates held a meeting with Parameswara Mayer, the World Bank Executive Director for India and Sri Lanka. The State Minister said that he congratulated the Sri Lankan authorities on implementing the series of difficult reforms. Parameswara Nayar updated the Sri Lankan delegation on the various internal restructurings within the World Bank and how these changes could benefit countries like Sri Lanka and assured his fullest support to Sri Lanka. IMF earns recognition for sustainable practices in major meetings. The International Monetary Fund has achieved the International Standard for Event Sustainability, ISO 20121, for the spring meetings and annual meetings. This certification by the British Standards Institution recognizes the IMF's commitment to managing the environmental, social and economic impact of its operations during the meetings. The ISO 20121 provided the fund with a framework and guidance that was flexible and rigorous in measurement and monitoring, enabling the institution to track positive and negative impacts over time and take necessary steps to address them. The News First Finance Report India has allowed onion exports to Sri Lanka with additional quotas to the UAE. India has allowed a limited quantity of onion exports to the United Arab Emirates and Sri Lanka at a time when the staple vegetables' outward shipments have been kept under restrictions. The Indian Ministry of Commerce and Industry, through the Directorate General of Foreign Trade, issued a notification late Monday evening permitting the export of an additional 10,000 metric tons of onions to the UAE, above the 24,000 ton already allowed, and 10,000 ton to Sri Lanka facilitated through the National Cooperative Exports Limited. In March, the centre allowed the export of 50,000 tons of onions to Bangladesh. The government has extended the ban on the export of onions until further orders. Initially, India had in early December 2023 prohibited the export of onions till March 2024. Seven people were injured and hospitalized after a three-wheeler plunged into a well in Polgahavela. Police said that a three-wheeler veered off the road in Hondala Polgahavela and plunged into a well in a nearby paddy field. Seven people, including four children, were inside the three-wheeler at the time of the accident. This included the mother, father, the four children and their grandmother, who sustained minor injuries. The three-wheeler was later recovered from the well. A 79-year-old man was killed and two others were injured when a three-wheeler collided with a van in Marvanella. The driver of the van was arrested over the accident. A head-on collision was reported between two cars along the Valimada Nuarelia main road in the Balungala section. News First correspondent reported that the woman who sustained injuries in the accident is currently receiving treatment at the Valimada base hospital. Three people were injured yesterday in a collision between two cars along the Mataraham Banthura main road near Kula. 
The accident occurred when a car travelling from Hambantota collided with another car travelling from Mathara. The injured have been hospitalised. Police reported a total of 23 fatalities in road accidents over a three-day period from the 12th to the 14th of April. On the 12th of April, eight people lost their lives in eight separate accidents. The following day, the 13th of April, saw four fatalities reported. On the 14th of April, authorities reported 11 deaths in road accidents. And on the world today, our top story is coming in from Australia. Now, a knife attack during a service at an Assyrian church in Sydney was a terrorist attack motivated by suspected religious extremism, Australian police said today. At least four people were wounded in the attack, including Bishop Mamari Emanuel of the Assyrian Christ, the Good Shepherd Church, during a live-streamed service in the western Sydney suburb of Wakeley on Monday. The incident triggered clashes outside the church between police and more than 500 of the bishop's followers who demanded the attacker be handed over to them. Police arrested a 16-year-old male suspect at the scene on Monday and were forced to hold him at the church for his own safety as a crowd of worshippers gathered outside. Now shifting your focus to the US. Donald Trump will return to a New York courtroom as a judge works to find a panel of jurors who will decide whether the former president is guilty of criminal charges alleging he falsified business records to cover up a sex scandal during the 2016 campaign. The first day of Trump's history-making trial in Manhattan ended with no one yet to chosen to be on the panel of 12 jurors and six alternates. Dozens of people were dismissed after saying they didn't believe they could be fair, though dozens of other prospective jurors have yet to be questioned. It's the first of Trump's four criminal cases to go to trial and maybe the only one that could reach a verdict before voters decide in November whether the presumptive Republican presidential nominee should return to the White House. The Philippine president said his uh, administration has no plan to give the United States access to more Philippine military bases and stressed that the American military's presence in several camps and sites so far was sparked by China's aggressive actions in the disputed South China Sea. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., who took office in 2022, allowed American forces and weapons access to four additional Philippine uh, military bases, bringing to nine the number of sites where U.S. troops can rotate indefinitely under a 2014 agreement. The Biden administration has been strengthening an arc of security alliances in the region to better counter China, a move that dovetails with Philippine efforts to show up its external defense, especially in the South China Sea. Marcos's decision last year alarmed China because two of the new sites were located just across from Taiwan and southern China. Beijing accused the Philippines of providing American forces with staging grounds, which could be used to undermine its security. And that's a wrap of the news we have for the world today. Bringing you the news, I'm Hashni Pathirana. Hello and welcome to the news first sports roundup. On today's highlight, Australian all-rounder Glenn Maxwell has decided to take an indefinite mental and physical health break during the ongoing Indian Premier League. Uh, personally for me, I think it was a pretty easy decision to sort of, uh, I went to FAF and the coaches last game and said I think it's probably time that we tried someone else. Um, more so I've probably been in this situation before in the past where you can sort of keep playing and probably get yourself deeper into a hole and I think now is actually a good time for me to sort of give myself a bit of a mental and physical break, get my body right and hopefully if I'm required again during the tournament I can get back into a, a really solid mental um, and physical space where I can hopefully have an impact still for RCB. Maxwell only scored 32 runs in Royal Challengers Bangalore's first six games and asked the management to be left out of Monday's 25-round defeat by Sunrisers Hyderabad. He also took a break to protect his mental health in 2019. Maxwell, who has taken four wickets this season, came into the tournament in good form with the bat, averaging 42.26 in 17 T20s since November at a strike rate of 185.85. He scored the fastest century in 50-over World Cup history against the Netherlands and then made a maiden double century against Afghanistan as Australia went on to win the sixth title. Maxwell's decision to temporarily step away is the latest in the sport as players attempt to juggle the amount of cricket available to play as a result 
of the increasing global franchise leagues with the greater mental and physical demands it places on them. And that's all we have for today's The News First Sports Roundup. I'll see you soon with another edition. The CIC Pulathisipura New Year celebration was held in Hingurakkoda today. Sirasa TV was the media partner of the event. Ushering in the spirit of Sri Lankan tradition, the CIC Pulathisipura New Year celebrations kicked off this morning at the CIC farm in Hingurakkoda, Palonarwa. The event witnessed participation of senior CIC officials, government representatives, local residents and many others. The event was infused with vibrant cultural elements adding a festive touch. A highlight of the morning was a thrilling race across the village Throughout the day, keeping the crowds engaged with a variety of exciting games. These included classic Sri Bicycle racers are quite common during the Sinhala and Tamil New Year festive season here in Sri Lanka. However, an unorthodox bicycle race was organized in Nochiagama. Now, in this one-of-a-kind race, husbands must ride a bicycle with his wife riding pillion. We leave you tonight with footage from this unusual bicycle race. Oh, hey. Come on, 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 come on,